today. I'm really thrilled to be sharing my avocation of bird watching and bird photography with you. Many of us are relatively oblivious to birds. I sure was. Way back when I started getting interested in birding uh, 20 years ago, I thought I had to get out of Chicago to find birds other than robins, cardinals, and blue jays. I couldn't have been more wrong, which is why I'm so happy to show you these things today that I have learned about the Chicago area birds. The photos that you'll be seeing today are mine, and most of the shots were taken right here in Cook County Forest Preserves, the lakefront, and even out the windows of my condominium in Northfield. I hope you'll be surprised in, at the variety and the beauty of the birds found in this area. A miracle happens along the shore of Lake Michigan every spring and every fall. It's called bird migration. Few people are aware of the magnitude of the miracle. Literally millions of birds migrate through Chicago area guided by a north-south line that we know of as the shore of Lake Michigan. Over tens of thousands of years, many bird species have evolved to follow a special migration route known as a flyway. Between points as far south as the tip of South America and as far north as the Arctic Circle, migrating birds navigate through Chicago to get to their breeding places in the spring and to return with their young to their wintering grounds in the fall. Ornithologists and birders worldwide acknowledge that the Lake Michigan shoreline is one of the most important flyways for migrant songbirds, hawks, falcons, owls, waterfowl, gulls, terns, and shorebirds. Amidst the river of birds flying through our area, more than 355 species of birds have been recorded. So where are these birds and why don't you see them? For starters, the songbirds in particular migrate at night so you won't see them or hear them unless you've got insomnia. But they do come down to earth during the day to rest, to feed, to bathe, and to wait for favorable winds to help keep them, uh, carry them further north. You don't have to go anyplace special to see them, but you do have to go out and look in the appropriate habitat for the species that you want to see. If you want grassland birds, clearly you have to go to grassland birds. If you want forest birds, you've got to go to the forest. Prime spring migration month is May, and for birders in Chicagoland, the month of May is a combination of 4th of July, New Year's Eve, Thanksgiving, and your birthday all rolled into one. The month of June is breeding season around here and things quiet down a little bit as birds have found their mates and have set up their territories and are on the nest. However, one can bird 12 months a year in Chicago and have productive outings each time. I personally do bird 12 months a year. So let's get started with some pictures. On our opening screen, uh, first of all, I'm gonna start um, a, little, a little bird song. What, what you're hearing right now is, is a sort of spring um, of, of dawn chorus. When the sun comes up every morning, birds start singing, that's what they do. And frequently when a dawn chorus is loud, you don't even need, a, you don't even need a, an alarm clock because they wake you up. Uh, looking at the opening screen, uh, we have a rose-breasted grosbeak in the uh, upper left-hand corner. Um, upper right-hand corner is the beautiful uh, red-headed woodpecker. Lower right-hand corner is a, a red-winged blackbird, the first bird that comes back in the spring. And then the lower left-hand corner is the darling um, a downy woodpecker. So we're going to start uh, with the fact that uh, there are more than 10,000 species of birds in the world and they are absolutely fabulous. We'll start with some birds that are pretty familiar or should be familiar to you. For starters, uh, the American goldfinches are perfectly gorgeous. They are here year round. That's what they sound like. Here's another close up of one. This is, of course, is the male. And this is the American goldfinch in the winter plumage. I'm sure that you would, would have said to me, Mary Lou, I've never seen that gold bird in the winter, and you would be right, but the bird is here. It is the same bird. You can see the white, the black and white wing patches, and that identifies the bird. Uh, the goldfinches breed in August, and so they will pretty soon be starting to turn into their winter plumage after they've uh, started their families. Moving right along, the familiar northern cardinal, 
uh, is one of our, all of our favorite birds. Uh, they were not usually uh, common up in this area in Northern Illinois. They were a Southern Illinois bird, but when people started feeding, the Cardinals stayed. I came up here in the summer and stayed for the winter. So if you like to see Cardinals, be sure you put out that, um, that bird seed this winter. Here's the, um, the songs that I'm playing, uh, every bird has a lot of song, different songs. I'm gonna be playing what I think are the most typical songs uh, for you, uh, but understand that uh, birds have many, many different calls. This is another red bird, uh, not terribly common in area, but well, well known, a summer tanager. It doesn't have the black mask of the um, uh, American Cardinal, uh, Northern Cardinal. It doesn't have the crest, uh, but it is a perfectly beautiful bird and um, very prized when they're found. This one I photographed at the Grove in Glenview. That's on Milwaukee Avenue across the street from Apt. Here's his call. Moving right along, another red bird, once again, seen here, but reasonably unusual, is a scarlet tanager. One Mother's Day, I was walking over at Skokie Lagoons in the afternoon, and I found two of these handsome birds. Here's the call. Here was the other bird. The two of them were just flitting around happy. So this was, this was May, of course. Then there is the house finch, um, also a, sort of a red bird. This is a balcony finch feeder at my, uh, at my condominium in Northfield. The house finch, here's the first call. Then of course, everybody's favorite bird, the beautiful Baltimore Oriole. He's about the orange, only orange bird. He has a beautiful, uh, pure whistle of a call. That's it. There is another Oriole around here. It's known uh, as an orchard Oriole. I don't have a photograph of them to show you. Moving on to bluebirds. Here's a blue jay, uh, very familiar. Blue jays are great mimics. They spend um, a lot of time Im imitating other birds, but this is the call that is probably the most familiar. Here's the much beloved Eastern Bluebird. This is the male. He has that red breast and here's what he sounds like. They tend to like to perch at the top of trees and call. And then the indigo bunting. This is a male indigo bunting uh, photographed at the Grove in Glenview. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back this up for just a second. Uh, if you get this bird in the wrong light, he looks black. But if you get him, as you can see him at the top of this tree in the sunlight, he's a beautiful blue. And his, that's his song, a uh, kind of couplet. Here was an uh, indigo bunning coming to my bird bath in my Northbrook yard some years back. Okay, so here's a few kind of unusual colored birds. This is the perfectly beautiful cedar waxwing. Note the yellow bar at the end of its tail and the red tip of the wing, uh, which is uh, uh, supposed to be the, the tip of the wings uh, dipped into a red candle wax. That's why they call it a wax wing. Um, they have a lovely crest and a nice mask. And we see crowd, uh, flocks of these at the slough when we do our bird walks here in uh, Prospect Heights. The call is very high pitched. Some people can't pick up that call, but I, I'm hoping you can hear it. Courting cedar waxwings uh, will pass a berry back and forth in the spring. Here they are passing the berry and in my mind's eye, one of them is saying, this is for you, my dear. And the other one is saying, oh no, no, my sweet, you must have it. 
So they uh, finally somebody gives up and eats it and they start all over. Here's the ruby, the ruby throated hummingbird, our uh, most uh, popular and almost the only hummingbird. We get occasional vagrant hummingbirds, but ru ruby throated is the one that we see most around here. This little bird weighs one eighth of an ounce, one eighth of an ounce. And he flies from South America across the Gulf of Mexico, 600 miles without stopping. That's an incredible feat for any bird, but think of it for a teensy little bird like the ruby-throated hummingbird. When they get here, they're hungry. So I, I, I encourage you to put out hummingbird feeders and you will be likely be rewarded with a lot of, of hummingbird company. That's their call. It's, it's really more of a little context uh, note. Tip. This is the gray catbird. A gray catbird is uh, a mimic also, like the, like the jays. Um, you note that he has a, a, a dark a reddish uh, undertail and a, a black cap. But when you see a bush, it sounds like it's got six, six different birds in it. It's very likely the gray pat catbird imitating all the other birds. This is just his own normal call. They're very chatty, and um, you usually know if they're around. This is the beautiful rose-breasted grosbeak. He's just been chowing down on some buds. As you can see, this shot was taken in the spring with the, the young uh, spring leaves. The female of the rose-breasted grosbeak is brown speckled, but has that same large beak so that you, you can realize that they are indeed a male and a female, although they don't look at all alike. This is the common grackle. Most of the time this bird looks to you just like a blackbird, but if you get it in the light, you can see uh, the stunning iridescence. Uh, this bird was photographed over at Air Station Pro, uh, Prairie in the Glen, and uh, he was really looking mighty fine that day. Kind of a breeding call. Everybody's favorite bird, the black capped chickadee. These guys um, are totally lovely and they have a couple of calls, but this is the typical one. Chickadee, dee, 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 dee. Here's another uh, popular bird. This is the white breasted nuthatch. They will come spiraling down a tree trunk and calling at the same time. This is going to sound, this call is going to sound a little loud. It is, the bird in the wild doesn't sound as loud as this. They're very, they're very active birds. You got to get on them fast. This is the dark eyed junco. This is the one we are never looking forward to seeing because they are a winter resident. That means when they show up, it means winter is on its way. I haven't seen a dark-eyed junco yet this year, and I'm hoping to keep it that way. Everybody's probably familiar with morning doves. They're a very common bird around here. Uh, they have a pointed tail and a kind of a small head, but what I like to point out, and, and the reason I show you this picture is that people rarely see that very pretty light blue eye ring that the morning dove has. And here's its call. It sounds to me like it says hula hoop hoop hoop. See if you agree with me. Hula hoop hoop hoop. Okay, so there's a lot of different kinds of sparrows around here. And not to disparage sparrows, they are charmers. And, uh, and, and as, as birders say, not all sparrows are boring little LBJs. Birder is, that's birder talk for a little, little brown jobs. If you don't know what a bird is, you call it a little, an LBJ. Here's the handsome white crowned sparrow.
That's his charming call. Here's the next, this is a white-throated sparrow. I'll back you up for a second. Notice that there's not a strongly delineated white throat on this bird. It's a little white under there, but this, this guy has got a strongly delineated white throat. He has the black and white stripes on his head and he also has the yellow lures. Uh, it, that's the part before between the eye and the beak. The mnemonic for that is poor John Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. This is uh, the fox sparrow, a winter sparrow that we have. Very attractive bird, very active. And now a bird that will come to your feeders if you put out uh, seed. This is the beautiful chipping sparrow and he's got a charming trill. We see and hear chipping sparrows when we walk around the slough. Here's the grasshopper sparrow. This is a grassland bird. It, the call kind of sounds like an insect to me, which is a, probably why it's called the grasshopper sparrow. And this is the uh, most common sparrow that we have around here. Uh, it's a song sparrow. It has typically has a stick pin in the center of its chest that you see there, plus a few little um, stripes, but nothing, no clearly delineated striped breast. Here's the song sparrow's song. It can, the song can be variable, but if, you, if you're out and listening, you'll hear it a lot. And this is a bird that 20 years ago was considered really quite rare. Happily, they've been uh, doing a lot of work with these grasslands and trying to make them uh, appropriate for breeding Henslow sparrows. And they have pretty much done a good job of naturalizing around here. It has an unusual little call. See if you can hear it. I think it sounds a little bit like a sneeze. People have other descriptions of it. That's it, just that little pssst. So that's the Henslows. And then this is the uh, Savannah Sparrow. And then we, we close our Sparrow chapter with the unappreciated and very unloved house Sparrow. The house sparrow is unloved because it's a non-native bird. Uh, it is a native to England, and it was brought over here uh, by some people, some well-meaning people. They brought a few birds into New York City and within a, in about 1852, and within about 100 years, the birds had spread all the way to the West Coast. So this is a very rigorous, uh, energetic little bird and uh, it is not well loved in this country because it takes the niche and the food of our native birds. Um, however, we do seem to be stuck with them. Um, in England, sadly, uh, it is much loved and it is very much in trouble. The, the populations are going down and nobody can figure out why they're going down. So um, here, here's the house there. Okay, so we're moving on to waterfowl and wading birds. One of the most wonderful birds that we get through here in the early spring is common loons. Now, co common loons are not so common around here, but they do come through here and we do get out and see them. Uh, they, they come as soon as the water unfreezes. Uh, so sometimes the loons will get stuck here a little while because the word is out they somehow have their own way of knowing that the lakes further north are still frozen. So here's, here uh, is another shot of a common loon uh, doing the leg waggle. I call it the leg waggle. I'm not sure what anybody else calls it, but it amuses me no end. They love to put their leg up. 
and I have seen baby loons. I've gone up to Canada to photograph baby loons, and one day old baby loons will be doing the leg waggle. They are just so, it just amuses me so much. This is, this is the call of the loon. We, we don't ever hear that call because that's the call that they make when they're uh, on their breeding grounds up northern Canada and, and they're either looking for a mate or, or nesting. So uh, I was, I, I just have to show you this picture because I was over at a lagoon um, at, at the uh, east end of the uh, Glenview Park District and I saw this loon diving and he was diving and diving. So every time he went down, I, I ran to another tree closer and closer and closer to him. Finally, I got there and he came up with this fish just right in front of me. I was very lucky to get this shot and um, almost dropped my camera. I was so excited. So here's probably the most beautiful duck we have in this area. They do breed here. They are, it is the wood duck. And uh, once again, the male is on the left. And um, he is quite fancy. And the, the little female, this is not a young one behind him. That is his mate. Uh, the female in this species is, is the one that sits on the nest. And she needs to be cryptic so that she, uh, the ne nest stays hidden. Um, and uh, here's, here's I was, I was very lucky, oh, stop that noise. Um, I was very lucky that a pair of wood ducks came to the lake at my condominium association this past spring. So I was able to get this wonderful close-up shot of the drake. Um, they, are, they are simply splendid and a real treat. Uh, there are a lot of wood ducks that nest and hang out at the slough in Prospect Heights. And we see them on our bird walks. Uh, Dave Ludwin had a beautiful shot of the wood ducks at the slough at his uh, photo uh, posting at the library uh, a year or so ago. These are American coots. These are reasonably common around here. They have a red eye and that uh, ring on the tip of the beak. I, I had to include the mallard. They are so common that people tend to take them for granted, but they really are very beautiful. This, of course, is the drake. That's pretty, pretty standard sort of duck call. Here's another shot showing that if you get these birds in the right light, they get a particularly beautiful uh, metallic green sheen on their, on their head. We all probably know Canada geese too well. It, by the way, it is not Canadian geese. It is Canada geese with their little ones. There, believe it or not, there once was a time when this bird was considered endangered, but that was a long time ago. We now probably have more Canada geese than we want. You've probably heard that call a lot too. Here's a couple of great egrets at Techni Basin in Glenview, posing nicely for me. It always amuses me to see that, hear that bird call. I think they're such beautiful birds and that is such a croak. Maybe the prettier the birds are, the more um, awful their calls are. I just had to show this picture because you don't often get two species uh, posing for you in one frame. This is the great blue heron. These are usually solitary birds. Uh, they are very attractive and uh, frequently they are found uh, around golf courses where there's water. This one was at Techni Basin. He also has a bit of a croak. This is in breeding plumage, which of course is the spring. Uh, he will have those long, long plumes. This is a green heron that was uh, hanging out in the marsh, just in the marsh, just west of the Northfield Fire Department, walk, walking distance from my condominium. Um, 
He was clearly looking for something to eat. That was their, that's their call. Here he is, he spotted a fish or a frog. And then, and then he got alarmed. I have never seen a green heron raise his crest until I took this, this, this picture. One day I was looking out my window and lo and behold, here is a black crown night heron on the tree right outside my balcony or right outside my condominium. I ran and got my camera and he obligingly sat around and waited till I came and got a shot. This is a state endangered bird. Uh, there is a, a colony of them over on the Valley Low Golf Course. And I'm sure that's where this bird had come over here for. for. Here's his call. This is a double crested cormorant. Uh, it's a it's a fish eater, a diver. What a strange call that is. This is over at Lake Glenview. There's a log uh, that they love to sit on. You can see the log is anchored in place by that chain. Um, the, for some reason, the plumage of the uh, double-crested cormorants is not waterproof. And so as a result, when they get out of the water, they, they hold their wings out to, in the sun to dry off and warm up. Shorebirds. Here's our predominant uh, gull around here. It's called a ring-billed gull. Uh, it has a slightly gray back, as you see, and black on the wingtips. Uh, note that the legs are gray. The other common gull that we have around here is the herring gull. And it is larger than a ring bill and it will have pink legs. So if you see something that looks like a gull and it's got pink legs, it's a herring gull. If it doesn't have pink legs, probably it's a ring bill gull. This was a, a bird that I photographed down at Montrose Point. Uh, this is a, a ruddy turnstone seen occasionally um, along, along uh, down at Montrose or along the lakeshore. Not, not, it was kind of a, a bit of a, a, a good bird to catch on a given day. There was one not too long ago. This I took a few years ago. Uh, Montrose is a, a former Nike missile site. It sticks out into the uh, lake and that was, it was Lake Phil, um, and it has, the Nike missile site is now gone, and it is now a wild bird sanctuary because it sticks out into the lake. It's very much um, a migrant trap. Birds just, as they're migrating up the lakeshore, they come down and drop at Montrose, and, and birders just descend upon Montrose during migration, and of course they haven't been able to do that this year because of the pandemic. And believe me, every Chicagoland birder, including yours truly, has been very frustrated over not getting to Montrose. Come on, buddy, talk to us. It's a quiet little peep back there in the background is all. This is a spotted sandpiper, a reasonably common shorebird around here. This one was photographed over at Lake Glenview. When it's not breeding season, he'll lose his spots. This is the beloved uh, piping plover. These are the little birds that, I, that uh, showed up at Montrose Dunes uh, last year and nested and raised three babies and they migrated and they turned around and came back again this year and once again have raised three babies. Um, they have not nested in this area it, that anybody knew of for at least 75 years. That's why it's been written up, these two birds have, or these birds have been written up a lot in the Trib and other publications and um, there's even been a film work was made of them last year uh, they're awfully cute birds, but they are absolutely teensy, and you can't imagine how teensy those the little babies are. This is an adult. This is the semi-palmated plover, um, a good bird, 
not as rare as the piping plover. Uh, it has uh, a webbing between its toes that you can't see very well in this picture, but that's why it's called semi-palmated. This is its call. This is a killdeer, a very common bird. This is the bird that if you, it nests on the ground and if you get close to its nest, it will pull the broken wing trip, a uh, uh, broken wing, it'll flap and, and, and you will follow it and it will lead you away from their nest. I've seen them do this many times. They are absolutely masters at it. Uh, you wanna say to them, for pity's sake, quit nesting in the gravel on the ground and you wouldn't have to do that. But anyway, they do tend to say their name in their call. See if you can hear, hear Kildee or Kildee or in this call. These are sandhill cranes. Uh, a couple of pairs of sandhill cranes have uh, raised young out at Crabtree Nature Center uh, over the past years. They're beautiful birds. They are gray, uh, but sometimes they paint their feathers uh, with mud. I think probably to keep the insects away. These are, this must be spring because these are not painted at this point. I got this close up, this one, this close up I got up in Michigan where these sandhills were very tame. The ones in Barrington are not quite so tame, but I love the fact that you can see right through his nostril. Um, oh, did, I don't think I played this sandhill call, did I? No, nope. sorry. This is a barn swallow, barn swallows, all swallows mostly fly. You, you're very lucky to get a, a picture of them stopped, uh, but this is the barn swallow. If you see a silhouette of a swallow and it has a forked tail, it's a barn swallow. You would rarely see that nice brown face and belly uh, when they're flying. Here's the call. Another very common swallow around here is the beautiful tree swallow. They have that nice metallic blue and a white belly. Uh, here's their color. This is a, a fairly common bird that nests around here, the Eastern Kingbird. He's basically got the light gray belly and a, a darker gray back with a white band on his tail. You can sort of see the white on the tail, but uh, it's a, if you see it from the other side, it's a fairly distinct band. They've, they've been nesting over at uh, Techni Basin, uh, kind of behind Coles and behind uh, Hospice of the North Shore uh, for years. Here's their babies calling. And this is the Eastern Phoebe, also a gray and white bird. Uh, it's rather plain, but it has a lovely call, it says its name. Phoebe, Phoebe. So we're into marsh birds now. This is a fairly skulky bird called a Virginia rail. Here's another shot of a Virginia rail. I think I took this at uh, Glenview Naval Air Station at Air Station Prairie. Forget Glenview Naval Air Station. And this is a Virginia rail baby. Um, they have two ponds uh, that are basically just re uh, rainwater. Uh, as the babies uh, start growing up, but before they're ready to fly, the, uh, the ponds tend to dry up. So happily, the uh, air station prairie uh, people who control the place do fill up the ponds with water to keep the, keep the babies and adults happy till they can fly away. Here's a Virginia rail baby with a crayfish. What a nice prize that was. Slightly older Virginia rail baby. And this is a Sora. I've seen these uh, Soras out at um, Crabtree. They have a kind of a whinny call. And here's a Sora baby. They really are funny looking little critters.
Here's a house wren. These are wonderful birds to have in your backyard. They sing their hearts out. And uh, I think you sh you're supposed to put up houses in twos. Uh, that way, I think that the male starts to build a nest and the lady picks which one she prefers. They're fun birds to have in your backyard. This is a marsh wren, not a backyard bird. Moving right along, this is a thrush. We get thrushes through here in the spring. And um, the, the hermit has, you can almost see a little bit of red tinge on its tail. A pretty call. This is the uh, fabulous brown thrasher, reddish brown, a good sized bird and very energetic call. So this is a bird that you won't see often. Um, you will hear it if you go out in the woods at night. They, uh, they are found in wet woods. Uh, we did um, a rally trying to find them and I found them uh, next to the fire department in Northfield. I found them over in the woods in Skokie Lagoons. Uh, in the spring, they display by go, flying straight up and then and, and coming back down in the same place. Um, and they, they have a call that's called a paint and uh, here's what it sounds like. Unmistakable. So a few grassland birds for your entertainment. Here's the beautiful bobolink and he has a wonderful bubbly call. This is the male bobolink. The female, once again, is not as fancy as he is. Here's the dick sissel. Another dick sissel, another shot of a dick sissel singing. They throw their sills into their paws. And here's an eastern meadowlark. There is also a Western meadowlark that has a prettier call, but you'll, I think you'll think this is fairly pretty. I do. Okay, we couldn't go on without the woodpeckers. This is the darling downy woodpecker that we had on the cover. There's his chip note. This is the hairy woodpecker. Harry's and downies are both black and white. Uh, the hairy is noticeably larger, uh, but sometimes size is hard to tell if they're not side by each. If you see the length of the bill, uh, you know which is a downy. It's got a very small bill, and the, the hairy's got a nice long bill, also a deeper sounding chip call. Here's the red bellied woodpecker, male. Um, they have a wonderful chuckle sort of uh, call. Now, I, I have to tell you that taxonomists name birds by what it seems to birders to be the least distinctive feature. This bird has a pale pink wash on its underbelly, which you can't even see in this photograph. But a taxonomist is holding a taxidermied bird in his hand and looking at it and sees this little pink wash and says, well, we've already got a redheaded woodpecker, so we'll call this the red-bellied. So that's why, as far as I can tell, the red-bellied woodpecker is called red-bellied. It's a nice kind of chuckle sort of call. Here's a female. Notice that the red doesn't come all the way down to its beak, although there's a little pink above its beak. Female red-bellied woodpecker at the, at the uh, bird bath. Here's the magnificent redheaded woodpecker. These are very beautiful birds, and unfortunately, they're declining around here. 
nobody quite knows why, but it probably is because people take down their dead trees. They need, in fact, all woodpeckers need dead trees. There was a pair of net, a red head of woodpeckers nesting at the 17th hole of Skokie Country Club uh, golf course, which is where I photographed these. And then, and then the pileated, the pileated woodpecker is the largest woodpecker. This is primarily a uh, Southern Illinois bird, but it is indeed uh, becoming more common up here. I've seen pileateds up at Ryerson Woods, and I've seen uh, pileateds at um, uh, at Deer Grove, Deer Grove East. Uh, this is the female, and it, they are very noisy birds. And unmistakable to see because of that big crest. Here's the yellow yellow belly sack suck, sap sucker. This again is a triumph of taxonomous naming because the yellow belly is practically invisible. Uh, these birds are around here. You will see the holes that they drill. They d drill horizontal holes to su suck the sap out of your trees. Beautiful birds. Here's a northern flicker. This is quite a common bird. We see these around the um, slough all the time. Um, this is the male, and here's his unmistakable call. We couldn't go without showing you raptors. Here's a red-tailed hawk uh, soaring over Air Station Prairie. Um, the the red tail is viewable from the top. I don't have a shot of the top of this bird. Um, they typically have a belly band, which this one does, and patagial marks from where the, where the wing attaches across uh, to the body. The top of the wing is a patagial mark. Here's his call. Frequently, you'll hear that call, and, and if you hear it, you know to start looking for a red tail. It's very distinctive. This is a Cooper's hawk that I photographed at Chicago Botanic Garden. Much smaller than the red tail hawk, uh, but a good, um, a good, fairly common hawk around here. And of course, uh, they they do uh, look for small mammals like mice, um, rodents, or even <clears throat> small birds. Um, here's their call. Ospreys are more common around here now than they used to be. Uh, you can see a ton of them down in Florida, but we do have them up here. We've had them on the slough walk, bird walks around the slough. Uh, they're fish eaters and, um, and people are eager for them to come nest around here. Uh, uh, there have been a couple of platforms, very towering platforms, uh, put up in Skokie Lagoons, but so far I have not seen that they've ever been used, utilized by an osprey. Here's the call. And here's our littlest falcon, the charming uh, American kestrel. This little guy was in rehabilitation. Uh, rehab uh, people have to have uh, federal licenses to treat uh, migratory birds because they are all protected, federally protected. Um, but this little guy will be released as soon as he's, he's well. Uh, this is uh, at, photographed at Barn Swallow. Um, it's a rehab facility up on, on, in Illinois, Northern Illinois, almost on the Wisconsin border, uh, run by a woman named uh, Linda Brewer. Terrific gal. And here's an American kestrel in the wild. That's a typical uh, place for them to hang out on telephone wires. They aren't, they aren't very big. They're, they're not as big as a, um, they're bigger than a robin, but, but only just. Of course, our wonderful bald eagle. These are usually quite prominent down at Starved Rock. They are uh, also very prevalent out on the Mississippi River. This of course is an adult. It takes them five years 
to get the white head and the white tail of an adult bald eagle. Here's the call. The good news about bald eagles is that they were in serious decline and they are bouncing, they have bounced back very well. You now frequently see them. I had one fly across my car as I was driving up Frontage Road uh, on the west side of Eden's Highway the other day. Here's a peregrine falcon. Peregrine falcons were extirpated around here. For some reason, they have rediscovered Chicago. Uh, this is Molly. Uh, she belongs to Mary Hennon. She is blind in one eye, and so she can't be released into the wild. So uh, Mary Hennon, who is in charge of the peregrine falcon program in Chicago, has Mary as her, her pet. Um, and she does take her around for um, live bird uh, presentations. Uh, the peregrines are nesting in several buildings. They make quite a mess, uh, but I think most people who have them nesting on their balconies are so thrilled to have them that they put up with the, the nuisance. Anyway, here's the, uh, there are peregrines in the wild. We had one up at, uh, on the lakefront last uh, fall. Kind of sounds like a hiccup, doesn't it? This is uh, the uh, turkey vulture. Uh, they aren't particularly beautiful birds. Uh, they have a bald head because they are carrion eaters and it makes no sense to have feathers where you're gonna get stuff that you don't want in their feathers. Um, they are uh, not terribly common around here, but uh, if you see them flying, you won't mistake them. Here's a, a view of them flying. And this is, this is a turkey vulture in flight. Uh, there's two things that distinct, makes it distinguishable. First of all, and most obviously, the wings are two-toned. Uh, and then the other thing is, because of that a featherless head, uh, it almost kind of looks, it either looks like a headless bird or a, a, head with, a bird with a very small head, which is indeed what it is. Okay, so these are the jewels of the bird world. These are what all birders go bonkers for particularly in the spring when they are in breeding plumage. Most of these birds, not all, but most of these birds uh, breed in Canada. So they are only resting up here in our forest preserves uh, prior to getting further north where they breed. Uh, this is one of these times where we have to try to talk the Canadians out of destroying the boreal forest because that is indeed where these birds need to nest. We're starting off with the uh, black and white warbler. Some of these birds' uh, uh, calls are very, very high. This is a yellow warbler. The last part is the most typical call, that sweet, 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 little more sweet of the yellow warbler. This is a, a warbler that does breed around here. This is the stunning Blackburnian warbler, always a, a prized bird. I had them this spring over at Sophie Lagoon. Chestnut side of Warbler with his lovely yellow cap and then chestnut sides. He's got a lovely little tasty caterpillar. These guys don't breed around here. He's trying to fatten up for the rest of his migration. The beautiful golden wing warbler, I had this in Skokie Lagoons this spring. He buzz, buzz, buzz. Bee buzz, buzz, or bee buzz, buzz, buzz. Anyway, uh, yellow rump warblers are our most prominent uh, and frequent. They are highly variable, but they are usually just about everywhere. And uh, I, I just adore them. A few of them even actually stay around here in the winter. That's their call, but they do indeed have a yellow rump, which doesn't show in this picture, I'm sorry to say. This is the magnolia warbler, beautiful uh, black necklace.
And this is the bay breasted warbler. You can just barely see his bay breast. These birds are very small and very fast. They're insectivores. They won't come to your feeders. Um, and they're very difficult to photograph. So you're just pleased if you get even as, as poor a shot as this is. This is the oven bird. He doesn't want to sing for us. That's it. That people say that says teacher, teacher, teacher. I think it's the church, church, church. But anyway, um, this is the Cape May warbler, a beautiful one. Nice splotch on his cheek. Very high call. This is a, a, a bird that occasionally nests around here, the American red start. They flash their wings and their tails when they this, uh, hop about hunting for insects. Uh, once again, another triumph of the taxonomists calling this a red start when it's, this is the male and he's orange and, the, and black and the female is yellow and black. So take it for what it's worth, but this is what he sounds like. Uh, common yellow throat does breed here. It is a warbler and uh, he tends to sound like witchety, witchety, witchety. See if you can hear that. Black throated green. Z, 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 Z is what the mnemonic is for black throated green. Almost works. Here's one of the prettiest warblers that is, and, and this one does nest here. They've nested here for the last three years, over at, last few years, over at Skokie Lagoons. Here's this gorgeous bird. It's a very insistent call. And um, if they're around, you know it, and you're thrilled. And our last little fellow is Wilson's Warbler. He's known for his little black cap on his head. Here's his call. So a few owls just to uh, show you what's out there. Great horned owls are very common around here. They will duet starting in December. They will say this, the call that you're going to hear, a, a male will say one at this level and the female will come in and say it at this level. I don't have a recording of the duet, but I had them duetting outside my bedroom over in Northbrook when I lived there. Uh, here's the call. <laughs> So it would be hoo 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 hoo, and the other one would come in hoo hoo hoo, -hoo and the other would go hoo hoo hoo. -hoo. Anyway, it's pretty fun. I never found them in real life. This is a great horned owl owlet. They're fuzzy little funny things. A barred owl. Found one of these up at Rollins. No, not Rollins, Savannah. Cuba Marsh, Cuba Marsh, just sitting there staring at me one day. This is the Eastern Screech Owl. This guy was down at Morton Arboretum, very high. These are teensy little owls, just about this big, but they are fairly common, although you do, like, because they're nocturnal, you just don't see them very often. Here's their call. Nice trill. And then a northern saw wet owl, not a common owl, occasional, a rarity around here. This was down at Montrose at the Magic Hedge one year. He's small, he's, he's very small, a little bigger than a screech owl. And these were some long eared owls that were down in a small park on the south side of Chicago a few years back. There's actually three birds in this photo, one on the left, one in the center and upper right. Ooh. 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 
These birds are a rarity around here. This was a little park. People were walking their dogs underneath these trees, ladies with baby carriages, and these owls were sitting up there just totally non compass pupus. They weren't worried at all. There's three or four owls in this picture, if you can see them. One on the left, that there's an ear upper left. Anyway, uh, they, they, they were, they, there, are, there are occasional long-eared owls around here, but it's very uncommon. <gasps> Snowy owls do put in an appearance too. The thought is that when their prey crashes, they're an Arctic species. They don't belong down here. Uh, but from one year to the next, occasionally we will get a snowy. Um, I've seen them, uh, this one was out in Ogle County. I've seen them up along the lakefront, up and almost up on the border with Wisconsin. Um, so uh, it, it's always a thrill when you see them, but they really don't belong here. This is a juvenile because the adults are, uh, the full adults are all snowy white. <laughs> I've seen them up in Canada. The beauty of going birding is occasionally there aren't any birds. If there aren't any birds, at least there's other things to look at. And we'll just do a quick run through of things that I've seen. You might see a painted turtle. You might run across a muskrat. You might see a beautiful Baltimore checker spot butterfly nectaring on Rudbeckia, which we would call a brown-eyed Susan. Uh, this is a buckeye butterfly. This is a tiger swallowtail on a liatris, native plant. Monarch on butterfly weed. Great spangled flitter, fritillaries on thistle. The zebra swallowtail, spectacular bird, um, butterfly. Dragonflies are amazing. There are incredible varieties of dragonflies. There are whole societies to study dragonflies. There are male and female dra dragonflies that are different from each other. This is a white-faced meadowhawk. This is a 12-spotted skimmer, female. Eastern pondhawk, you can't even, the wings are clearer, see-through, but they're there or they wouldn't be able to fly. Here's a frog and duckweed at Crabtree Nature Center in Barrington. Here, here, I, here I am at the Grove. A white-tailed buck stood up as I was walking across that um, walkway across the little marsh. And then back in the woods, I was trying to photograph a bird and I turned around and there was this white-tailed doe staring at me, <laughs> watching me watch birds. So on to the part of what we can do. Birds do need help, I'm sorry to tell you. Um, you may have heard in the news that just this year they reported that the, uh, there has been a report out from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and the American Birding Association, or American Bird Conservancy, that almost 3 billion birds have disappeared from North America in the past 50 years. That's astounding. That's climatic. I mean, it is calamitous. It, it needs to stop. And so, so what I hope you will do is take to heart the few things that I'm going to suggest that you could do to help birds because they do need help. You must keep your kitty cats indoors. That is where they belong. They are not native. They do not belong outside. Domestic cats kill more birds than any other threat at all. All cats want to go outside. They all do. This is my Gracie. She has never foot, set foot outside except to go to the vet and she never will. Uh, provide food to birds. It's good for the birds and it's good for you. It's very entertaining to see the birds come to your feeder and even your pets, particularly your cats, love to watch your feeders. I recommend that you buy your food at bird stores because they have a greater turnover and they get deliveries all the time. Hardware stores would might not sell out their stock and rotate their stock quickly. If you buy a bird, for instance, thistle, which is what the um, Niger thistle, which is what the goldfinches eat, is, is kind of pricey. And if you buy a bag of, of, of Niger thistle at the hardware store and it's musty, the birds won't eat it and you've wasted your money. Um, there is a, 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 a good place to, uh, if, you, if you're going to be feeding a lot, the best prices are up at Grace Lake Feed Meal. They turn their stock over quickly and they're a wonderful place to buy. 
uh, I highly recommend feeding uh, hummingbirds. I, I feed every year, all the year. I make my own nectar. You do not have to dye the nectar red. Uh, you just dissolve one quarter cup sugar to one cup water. You can make a large amount of it and keep it in the fridge. Um, put it out and w watch for the birds to come. Um, they will also, uh, hummingbirds also love blue salvia. So you can get, if you prefer, you can get a, a blue uh, hummingbird feeder. Um, I stick with the red, tried and true, but, uh, and I get plenty of feeders, uh, plenty of hummingbirds at my third floor feeder. Remember, this is the eighth ounce, eight, one eighth of an ounce bird that flies across the, Me the Gulf of Mexico to get here. Think about that. It's astounding. Put out suet for your birds in the winter. If you want to put it out in the summer, you can, uh, but you have to get no milk for the summertime. Uh, I recommend hot pepper suet if you have trouble with squirrels. Most squirrels don't like the hot pepper and it doesn't bother the birds at all. Birds do love suet, particularly woodpeckers. Uh, provide water year round. Sadly, or, or strangely enough, birds need water uh, almost more than they need food. Shallow metal dish is excellent. Shallow is the key. They like to be able to stand in the water and bathe, but if it's too deep, they won't use it. They also like are attracted to moving water. This little device shimmers the water. Uh, for the winter time, you can get a coil or you can buy a heated bird bath to keep water from freezing. Uh, you of course have to have a place to plug it in. Um, I, I go to Wild Birds for this stuff, uh, but I'm sure you can probably find this sort of devices online as well. Uh, for your backyard, Leave some uh, a brush pile in your yard to create uh, some um, cover for the birds in the winter, uh, if, you, if you can stand having a brush pile. Uh, if you can stand it, your Christmas tree, uh, your live Christmas tree, once you're finished with it, is a great cover for birds in the winter uh, in your backyard, and you can get rid of it in the spring. Also in your backyard, if you, if, dead or dying trees pose no danger to people or to power lines, uh, leave, leave them up. Dead trees are what woodpeckers need. Woodpeckers can't excavate live trees. The wood is too hard. And um, it, it can be, they can be, they give a lot to nature, a dead tree, uh, a food source for insects and for birds. And, and uh, if you can just, if, if it's a possibility, just leave them up until they have to go. Uh, use native plants, garden with native, native plants. Oh, they are so beautiful. And they're already adapted to the uh, kind of soil conditions that we have. Uh, and uh, they are, uh, uh, and the precipitation, and they don't need fertilizers or pesticides. Of course, the biggest advantage is that it's great for birds, bees, and other wildlife, so use native plants. This, they are, as you can see, these are all native plants, perfectly beautiful. Try to eliminate the use of pesticides on your yard or your, and your plants. It's better for you and it's much better for the birds. But most of all, for goodness sake, Roundup is a, a neonicotinoid. It's made by Monsanto and Monsanto must have some sort of hold on the government because this should not be sold in this country. It is bad for birds and because it kills insects galore. And it's believed to be carcinogenic, carcinogenic to humans. Just don't use, don't use it. I, I'm appalled that it's still sold in this country. It's not available in Europe. So um, window strikes are indeed a problem for birds. Uh, Pull interior curtains over the area of glass where birds are striking, if indeed birds are striking. Move large plants away from the windows during, during uh, the spring and summer when the birds are here. Uh, purchase uh, one of the American Bird Conservancy approved products uh, sold that, re uh, that are um, reduced collisions on glass. It's the window glare, the birds see the trees in the window glare and they fly to the reflection of the birds. So use one of the following things to reduce glare. These are uh, quick, dirty, cheap uh, tempera paint on a window or bird tape. Uh, but the third item is an acopian um, uh, wind 
uh, curtain, and I have bought that and have have ha had very great success with it. It's um, if you don't want to do the tempera paint or the tape, uh, I really recommend this Acopian um, Zen screen. It's it 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 is on the outside. You have to put it up on the outside. It's very easy to install. You can either make it yourself or you can buy it from from the firm. And there is a sheet of paper coming around to you that will give you the information on how to uh, find it. And uh, it is mentioned on the American Bird Conservancy website, which is outstanding, abcbirds.org. abcbirds.org is uh, the only international uh, company designated, designated to bird conservation. Please don't put out fake cobwebs. Um, they are traps for birds. birds get stuck in them and will die if they're not found and rescued. Um, I recommend uh, birds, uh, suppl bird supplies and bird feeding uh, advice. Uh, Tim Joyce, the manager of Wild Birds Unlimited, both in Glenview and Arlington Heights. He's a terrific guy. If you want help figuring out how to landscape your yard for the birds, Tim's your man, a great guy. The other thing is that you can drink, you can drink shade grown coffee. Up until about 1972, all coffee was shade grown. Somewhere along the line, the growers decided they wanted to develop the coffee faster. And so they developed a way to grow it in full sun. It grows faster in the sun. And so it uh, doesn't develop the natural sugars and it is more acidic. Uh, shade grown coffee provides bird habitat. The birds in turn provide natural insect control. So the growers of shade grown coffee don't have to put any chemicals onto their plants to uh, protect them. Also the shade trees filter carbon dioxide, which of course, as you know, is the cause of global warming. So, uh, and they also aid in, so in soil moisture retention. So look for shade grown coffee. Uh, they're on the sheet of information that will be mailed out to you. Uh, there are uh, places where you can get them. Uh, Sunset carries shade grown coffee. Uh, I think that Starbucks carries it and there's some places to order it from online. It's very, very good coffee. Birds can rebound with our help. The bald eagle was on the verge of extirpation in the 50s because of DDT. DDT killed indiscriminately all insects. And it was Rachel Carson who wrote her book uh, the Silent Spring. It was a very con controversial book, but she she nailed the chemical industry for spreading uh, disinformation and saying that their chemicals were okay. And in fact, they managed, she managed almost single-handedly with this book, managed to uh, ban indis indiscriminate use of DDT. And now, as we know, the bald eagle is thriving. So with help, our birds can come back Please do everything you can do to help them and, and enjoy them. They are there. Feed them and enjoy them. And particularly feed in spring and fall when the birds are either needing to be fed uh, or get ready for migration uh, from having migrated here in the spring. So thank you so much for watching and for doing anything that you can do to help birds. This is Mary Lou Mellon signing off. Bye.